Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today on our show, Lee Kresner, a pioneer of abstract expressionism, steps out of Jackson Pollock's shadow. Also, we'll tell you how an Australian artist is bringing street art indoors. And as Germany celebrates the centenary of the Bauhaus art movement, we take you to an exhibition which is remembering its sleek, pared-back aesthetics through photographs at first. Carving stories into precious stones, world-renowned jewellery maker Sevan Buchakçı invites Showcase into his workshop and inside his creative process. Not so far away from the hustle and bustle of Istanbul's Grand Bazaar sits the workshop of a man known as the Lord of the Rings. He's been making jewellery since the age of 12 that is now worn by some of the most famous people in the world, from A-list actors to rock royalty. By using precious stones as a canvas, Sevan Buchakçı has carved out a world that the entire world comes to Istanbul to see. And when he opened his studio to showcase, so did we. Every ring is one of a kind, so each has its very own story. Sometimes I tell a story inside a gemstone, but other times the gemstone has a story to tell me. I mean, we stay in touch and I think we get along quite well. I'm not an historian, but I'm still very lucky when it comes to connecting with my past. I was born and lived in Samatya, one of the oldest places in Istanbul, which used to be located within the ancient walls of Constantinople. I had my training in the Grand Bazaar, where I met my master at the age of 12. A couple of generations ago, the Grand Bazaar was actually a school for artisans. Later, a certain mentality has emerged, dictating that you have to produce a certain type of jewelry using only certain techniques. And it's all about cheap manufacturing and machine production now. But that's just not me. Here's the crux of the matter. A ring isn't just a geometrical shape, but rather where the craftsman finds freedom to tell his stories. There are and have been thousands of jewelry workshops all around the world throughout history. And all creators want to express themselves with a ring and to leave their unique mark. And I got lucky because an idea struck me one day. A simple idea. I just flipped a gemstone over and there was a shape of a dome and with it also the beginning of this design. This shape created an empty space for us to work on. Later we found a way to fill the space. People may think we empty out the gemstone and place a figure inside but that's not the case. We actually carve these figures into the stone upside down and later color it. This technique is called negative sculpting. And later on, we developed the technique even further and found a way to build 3D designs into the stones. I was surrounded by history. So when the time came, these stories came out naturally. This ring, for example, is very special to me. According to an old Armenian tradition, there is this ritual called blessing of the pomegranates. Every year we open our shops on the first day of the year. But before even putting our foot in the shop, we throw a pomegranate at the threshold and the fruit breaks into pieces. Its seeds scatter all over, inside as well as outside of the shop and we believe this brings an abundance of blessing. 
Ustamın öğretisi şudur. My master used to say, we should welcome the good fortune, but also give some of it back. That's what I see when I look at this ring. Topkapı Sarayı'nda e, eski saatler. Now we're also designing watches and there's a story behind this too. Years ago I visited an old clock collection at the Topkapi Palace, featuring pieces from the Ottoman times, from the 17th century onwards. There I saw there used to be very interesting clockmaker masters who have lived in Turkey. These were Malawi dervishes, who used to produce clocks with no commercial concerns. Some have only created one or two clocks in their lifetime, but they still work to this day. And look, there was no industry back then, so we wanted to put in as much effort as they did. And these last nine years, we have done that. We will have our 80-piece watch collection very soon. But obviously no magic is involved in the creation of a piece of jewelry. It's not like the skies tear apart and there comes the inspiration. The truth of the story is this is a hard-earned vision I extracted from the history. There's also teamwork behind it all. We have a crowded team here with our creative director Emre Delava and a group that includes designers, goldsmiths, stone setters and a sculptor. Everyone is welcome to bring their own story to the table. We see ourselves not like the knights, but like the artisans of the round table. Because everyone can have a say in the creation of a piece. Arts and craft are disappearing today. The old ways can't compete against technology. But we should remember our origins and where it all began. Maybe in some part of the world someone watches this and ends up wanting to actually do something about it. If there is just one person who feels that way, well, I'd call that having left a legacy. Coming up later on Showcase, the enduring influence of Bauhaus. A photo exhibition marks 100 years since the inception of the iconic German art school. Stepping into Rhone's empire, we'll meet the Australian artist who uses abandoned mansions as his canvas. Or that we've been left in a situation in Europe where because there's very little of the work here, we simply don't have an opportunity to appreciate her as an artist. That's all about to change as London's Barbican Centre shines the spotlight firmly on the life and work of Jackson Pollock's better half, Lee Kresner. Dazzling colours, splashes of texture and innovative layering of paint. I'm speaking about one of the greatest abstract expressionists of all time. And here you might think I'm referring to the famous and some say infamous Jackson Pollock. But I'm not. I'm talking about his wife Lee Kresner. She is the star of a new solo show at London's Barbican Centre. Is this finally the proof that the world is waking up to Kresner the artist? We sent our Miranda Atti to find out. There's an indescribable energy to the paintings of Lee Krasner. Swirls of colour, mosaic collages, paintings that surprise you with their scale. The Barbican's new exhibition is a joyous celebration of an artist who was too often overshadowed by her husband, the father of abstract expressionism, Jackson Pollock. 
We call the exhibition Lee Krasner Living Colour and it was because we wanted to celebrate both her literal use of colour and her metaphorical, sort of colourful, passionate, vivacious attitude towards life, which I think is what comes across so powerfully in the work. It's what makes us uh, so seduced by it, actually. But the exhibition is also about changing perceptions. It's about emphasising that Krasner was an established artist when she met Pollock. That she studied art, including under Hans Hoffmann, a famous teacher who'd known Matisse and Kandinsky. We show upstairs some of the work that she does for the War Services Project, that's in the 1940s. She's able to get that job because she's already a really respected figure in that scene. There are also, throughout her lifetime, many individuals, curators and critics who are great champions of her work. So it's more that we've been left in a situation in Europe where because there's very little of the work here, we simply don't have an opportunity to appreciate her as an artist. Krasner's work straddles mediums and styles. She created this mosaic table out of scraps from her life with Pollock. He died in a car crash in 1956, which sent Krasner into a spiral of grief. But it was also a huge source of inspiration, since her work after his death is on a new size and scale. We see colour becomes a central theme within her work from the little image paintings which are in the first rooms of the exhibition. But also, it then becomes something that's not just about when she does use colour, it's also about when she abstains from using colour. So we see that in the night journeys downstairs, that this is this period of very intense grief for her. She's suffering from extreme insomnia. And she says the only way she can continue to work at night under artificial light is if she completely restricts her palette to raw umber, burnt umber, and a kind of off-white color. Um, so it, it's something that we can also look at as a kind of barometer for her as an artist, for how she's feeling and operating and, and working. And I think that's uh, lovely to see within the show, that sense of how her life force ebbs and flows across the years. There is only one Krasner painting in a public collection in the UK, the 1961 piece Gothic Landscape, which is held by the Tate. But between now and September, the Barbican will be displaying a hundred of her works. And seeing the riot of shape, colour and expression here, I don't think Krasner will be thought of in the UK as Jackson Pollock's wife any longer, but first and foremost as an artist in her own right. Miranda Ratti, TRT Wells, London. An artist in her own right. To help us reframe Lee Krasner, UK editor of Artnet News, Javier Pes joins me. Javier, so in the exhibition, there are a um, hundred works displayed, most of which are um, being shown for the first time in the UK. How do you think this will affect the recognition of Lee Krasner in Europe? I think the exhibition at the Barbican Centre, which is the first in London for five decades, um, it's, it's great. It reminds Europeans just how good she was and how important she was in that moment when New York becomes the centre of the art world after the Second World War. And what is your impression of the works on display? The, the works, you can't help but be impressed with the scale of them, um, with their vibrancy, and also how she had her own voice. I think the, um, this show also reminds us that she, was, she wasn't just Jackson Pollock's wife, um, you know, the, the other great, another great American abstract artist, um, that she had her own, she was her own artist. In your article, you put together five battles that Lee Krasner faced, and the first one is being Mrs. Jackson Pollock. Tell me more about it. Um, well, it was one of the great, great love affairs um, that, you know, Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock fall in love, they move out to a farm outside of New York, and then they create extraordinary works. 
Um, Jackson Pollock is obviously the, the bigger name, um, and she she helped him become, you know, America's sort of one of America's leading painters. Uh, she also had to cope with his alcoholism and his, you know, violence. Um, and then so when he dies in a car crash, she's got uh, kind of two jobs to do really: to protect his legacy. Um, but also to protect a space for herself as an artist. And she famously, uh, after a while, moves into the barn where Jackson Pollock had the space to paint huge canvases. And she could suddenly you know, move out of the, uh, the bedroom in the farm to the barn and also create works that were really as impressive in scale and ambition. What other prejudices did she have to put up with to be taken seriously as an artist? Well, she was first-generation immigrant. Um, her, her, her parents fled the pogroms in Russia um, in 1908. Um, so she was Jewish. Um, she had to face the sexism of the world, and particularly the art world at that point. Um, so those are just three. And also the fact that once she is Jackson Pollock's widow, there's always a sense that people are kind of, you know, being extra friendly with her to get to Jackson Pollock's paintings uh, and therefore you know she needs to work out and also later in life she has to protect the um, the kind of she was very very careful very clever in not selling Jackson Pollock's works cheap uh, so obviously and then she had the legacy of dealing with the sort of setting up the Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock Foundation which does great work today. Now, what else do we know about their working relationship? How did they influence each other? I think it's really important when they first start going out together, uh, she doesn't, and when they're still in New York, she finds her own, she makes sure she has her own studio space. Um, yes, absolutely, she always acknowledged that he influenced her. How could he not? And she obviously helped shape his art. Um, but it's a mistake, and I think as soon as you go in the exhibition, she's not a kind of, uh, you know, a, a sort of lower league version of American abstract expressionism. She was, you know, she it was her own woman, she was her own artist. And I think people realised that at the time, but it may have got overlooked. And it certainly, uh, I think it surprised people in the 1960s when she had a big show in London, um, and some people thought that Lee Krasner was a man. What do you think is her contribution to art history? What kind of a legacy did she leave behind? She's important, as I said at the start. She's important because of uh, she was there. She was one of that generation of artists that had kind of absorbed all the great things going on in, in, in Europe, whether it was Mondrian, Picasso, Matisse. And then they created their own work that helped make New York the center of the art world after the Second World War. She was there. She wasn't just, you know, she, she can't, can't be written out that history. Um, and I think, and then, you know, towards the end of her life, she becomes a kind of role model, I suppose, for, you know, feminist artists. Um, and now we're seeing, I think what this exhibition is really about is uh, looking back at abstraction in particular and including female artists, but also including uh, black artists as well because it had got dominated by the, you know, the names of Pollock and Rothko and Barnett Newman, who were also important, but they weren't the only people who could do create amazing things with paint. And Javier, the exhibition is titled Living Colour to celebrate both her literal use of colour and Lee Krasner's passionate attitude towards life. What kind of a character did she have? OK, well, there's a famous story. Uh, she's a young artist and the famous playwright Tennessee Williams and a male artist come and they see her work and she throws them out of her studio. Um, so I think she would, she would be one of those women who didn't take any nonsense. Um, you know, having said that, um, she, uh, yeah, she, her, her boyfriend, you know, and they were very close before Jackson Pollock, uh, he was alcoholic, he was uh, uh, kind of uh, difficult to manage and that helped her kind of in a way cope with Jackson Pollock. So um, I think she was one of those women that didn't take nonsense 
Um, and she knew, you know, just how kind of chauvinistic people could be, men could be. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you on our show today. Thank you. This next story is about a marriage of form and function that some say is still the last word in taste and sophistication. I'm talking about the influence of Bauhaus, which is being revisited at a photography exhibition in Berlin. It's one of the many exhibits marking the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus Design School, both in Germany and around the world. But the show you're about to see isn't just about what you see. It's also about creating a dialogue between contemporary art and the avant-garde photography of the 1930s. The Bauhaus is mostly known for its modernist architecture, but at the Museum of Photography in Berlin, its photos are now taking center stage. The exhibition Bauhaus and Photography – A New Vision in Contemporary Art opens with a range of images from Hungarian artist Laszlo Moholy Nagy, who was a professor and designer at the school back in the 1920s. There are a lot of photographers here in the exhibition who taught at Bauhaus or were students at the school. But at the time, no one cared much about the brand Bauhaus, so no one said, let's make some Bauhaus photos. Even though they're black and white, I think they're still very modern. The radicalism of the composition of the pictures, the framing, the precision, the structure, that is something that's still fascinating. And it's a sign of the times, the 20th century. Ever since the school was founded in the city of Weimar in 1919, it revolutionized creative and artistic thinking worldwide. In the case of photography, Moholy Nagy coined the term new vision at the time, a movement that demanded artists to explore photography beyond just depicting reality. And now it's making a comeback. The show also features contemporary works by a number of living artists who were inspired by the Bauhaus movement or by the modernist type of photography at the time. Right now we are experiencing a revival of the ideas of the New Vision movement the experimenting with photography, the removal of photography from just depiction, that is once again becoming important. The Bauhaus Art School was only a teenager when the Nazi regime influenced its closure, but the movement's philosophy and way of seeing continues to inspire artists today. We've come to the end of another episode of Showcase. But before we say goodbye, let's step into a world of beauty and decay from a time long gone. Empire is the latest and greatest project to date for internationally renowned Australian artist Rome. This time, he immerses himself within a now derelict but once glorious Art Deco manor called Burnham Beaches in Sherbrooke, Australia. Remember, you can find lots of other great showcase stories on our YouTube channel. I'm Elif Thanks for watching. <laughs>